How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. I'm I'm just hanging out in cloudy Vancouver uh, on a day off and uh, trying to remember as much as I can about the Green Knight, which I haven't seen since October. <laughs> I was going to say I think your mind your mind has been preoccupied. Yeah, just a little bit, just a, just a smidge. Uh, so I have a, a few fun questions before. First of all, congratulations on the movie. Uh, I cannot wait to see it again. Nothing but positive things to say. Um, I'm really happy you made this. Um, and also we're, you know, making movies. But um, uh, who took home the crown from set and who do I need to bribe to get it? Oh, that's a great question. I think it's still in storage uh, with all the rest of our props uh, in the off chance that we had to do reshoots, which obviously now that, uh, that boat has sailed. Um, and so I think... I think it's somewhere in Chicago at the moment and in a warehouse. And I've, I've got very few props I brought home from the movie. Uh, and I want to get an ax. I want to get the crown. I need, I need, a, I need a few more things for my collection. A hundred percent. Is it true that you made the, 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 the round table, um, the C, uh, purely because of your love of Criterion and your hope that this will eventually get a Criterion release? Let's just let that legend live because uh, I think that is as good a reason to make that table look the way it does as any. Okay. Uh, I read, and again, could be wrong, that you had found your Willow action figures and then shortly thereafter wrote the script for this. Was that true? That's true. I had doing something in my closet, found a box of old childhood possessions that contained all of my Willow action figures and was just setting them up. <laughs> I was just like making a, made a little, uh, a little diorama of them in my backyard and thought to myself, it'd be fun to make a movie about a knight on a quest as I was placing my little miniature Mad Mardigan on his uh, miniature horse. And, and that begat this movie. Um, I've since put all my Willow toys on a place of honor on my shelf in my home office um, where they belong. And uh, I also bought the Ebor Sisk off eBay finally, because I was like, I need that dragon. I need it. Um, <laughs> Uh, if, if Disney had asked you to do the Willow uh, Disney Plus series, would you have had a tough time saying no? Yeah, it would have been a really tough time saying no. I, I would have, I would have, you know, I, I don't dally in, in episodic stuff too much just because my heart belongs to movies. But that's one world where I would have just really wanted to, uh, you know, spend some time. And I'm, I, I feel like I'm like sort of like, you know, I've got like a secondhand connection because a lot of the Green Knight cast went on to act in that. So I'll, I'll see some familiar faces in it. I love learning about the behind the scenes of the making of a movie, you know, hearing stories that maybe are, um, you know, not easy to hear. Uh, what do you think might surprise people to learn about the making of the Green Knight? Um, I don't know if it's a surprise, but it's interesting, which is that I was like deathly ill for half of the production. <laughs> and, and my memories of the entire shoot were just pain. <laughs> so that the fact that I actually was able to act finish making the movie, uh, especially now, like if, if we were to, if I were to get as sick as I did on this movie as now, I would have not been allowed on set because for obvious reasons, you know, with COVID protocol, um, I came down with some horrible flu and there were two days, Joel Edgerton's first day, two days on set, I couldn't talk. I had no voice and had to just communicate with handwritten notes. Um, so that is an, one bit of trivia that is not, it's funny now in retrospect, but at the time it was, I didn't know if I was going to make it out of this movie alive. <laughs> How long did it take for you to recover? Um, without getting too detailed, I had surgery upon my, my first ever surgery, first time going under as soon as we wrapped. I just was like, I was like, I may not survive this movie, but if I, if I can just make it, to, if I can make it to the final day of production, uh, then at least we'll have all the fridge in the can. Someone can put it together. And, uh, and so we wrapped and then I went home and went to the doctor and had surgery and, and was fine, thankfully. But um, there were definitely was a point where I was like, this might be the last thing I ever make. So I've got to just like pull, pull, pull it together and, and, and at least get all the footage in the can. I can't imagine what your wife was saying to you while you were shooting and how angry she might have been. I didn't tell anybody and no one knew. <laughs> so <laughs> I was just like, I was like this, I was like, all signs point to this being very serious. I'm going to just... Uh, you know, we got, you know, 20 days left. I'm just going to just push through and, and not raise any, you know, cause any waves. And then when I finally told my wife post-surgery, uh, she just laughed. <laughs> I was like, it was an odd moment where I was like, I was like, I feel weird that you're laughing about this right now, <laughs> but she did. Um, 
uh, one of the things is that uh, this movie has a lot going on in it. Um, there's a lot for people to enjoy and take away from. Um, what are you really excited for people to see in the film? I'm excited for them to see all of it. You know, like there's a lot of stuff in there and it's hard for me to pick one thing. You know, I went for a long period of like in, in an editorial process of not liking the movie, which happens with all my movies. You're learning what it is you made when you're editing. And with this one, it took me a long time to like embrace what it was that I'd made and to really separate the, the difficulty of production from the finished film. And, and so now I, I look at the movie almost with an objective, especially because we've had this long delay in getting it out into the world. I've got like an objectivity to it. And I'm excited to see what people discover in it because some, just to a certain extent, I know what's in the movie. I know what I put in there, but I don't know what people will pick up on. And, and I've, I've talked to some folks who have seen it and, and, the, the, and, and I've been pleasantly surprised at all of the things that I now realize were in fact intentional. Like people are like, well, that one thing you did, that inference you made, that reference, that, that theme that gets drawn out in this scene or that scene. I was like, oh yeah, that was something I was thinking about two years ago when we were shooting this. It wasn't, it wasn't an accident. There was intention behind this movie. And I'm so grateful that people are now getting the chance to like see those intentions realized. But um, I, hope, I hope people find that it's an adventure. I mean, that's my, my, what I wanted to do. I wanted to make an adventure movie. I wanted to make a quest film. And it's not a traditional adventure movie. It's certainly not Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings, but it shares some DNA with those things. And I, and I hope that people, the audiences appreciate and enjoy this sort of off kilter quest that we, we've created. And I hope, I hope also that it inspires people to go back and read the original poem, which is a really, uh, a really wonderful piece of literature that I, just even in, in preparing to talk about the movie, I've been rereading it. And it's just so, it's a piece of, it's a piece of uh, literature that just keeps on giving. You can just keep finding things in there that are just so beautiful, beautifully written. And it's, and it's so dense. I mean, it's been analyzed for almost the better part of a millennium at this point and with good reason. And I think we've, we've scratched the surface of what that text contains with this movie. And I hope that in scratching the surface, we've opened a door for people to go discover it. Yeah, it's pretty amazing that the poem is, what, 600 and something years old, that it was written that long ago, and it's still amazing. It's just, yeah. it's yeah. it's incredible. As, as, as archaic as it is, it's also very modern. Like, you read it, and it feels like something that, you know, could have been written, aside from the language, maybe being written in Middle English, of course, it's, on a narrative level, feels very, very modern. All the same, you know, uh, uh, narrative structures that we now enjoy as, as, as purveyors of media, like all were in play in the 14th century, including the giant third act exposition dump that uh, Morgan Le Fay gives in the poem. <laughs> uh, I, I, you mentioned a little bit about the editing. Um, I'm obsessed with the editing process because it is the final rewrite and, and the whole movie comes together in the editing room. Uh, did you have a much longer cut of the film? Can you sort of talk about the challenges that you encountered? Definitely. The, the script was maybe 85 pages, 80, 85. It was very short. And the first cut, which was true to that script, was like two hours and 45 minutes. And it was, it was just off balance. It didn't quite, it, it, it lurched around in a way that I didn't want the film to, to do. And so I, I, I spent a lot of time in the edit, like just trying to iron it out and make the rhythm of it flow naturally and organically. And that involved cutting a lot of material. Um, as anyone who's read the poem will know, the sequence at the Lord and Lady's Castle is quite extensive and we had to cut a lot of material. We, all, we, we originally had a much longer version of that that was truer perhaps to the text, but it just caused the film to be more unwieldy than it needed to be. And it really, you know, didn't need, it didn't need what the poem needed. And so I, I let a lot of material go. I reshaped a lot of material. We did every movie I do. I always schedule some pickups because you always find time. You always find things you wish you had. So we did a few days of pickups to sort of patch up some of the holes that were left uh, by those, by the excision of, from the excision of those scenes. And, and then I just spent a lot of time just ironing and ironing it all out. You know, the opening sequence with the green Knight in the script, that's probably five pages, but the first cut of that was 40 minutes long. And, and it was too long, you know, it was like, and so just finding a way to just sort of like 
you know, get the pace up, pick the pace up, get the green knight into the great hall sooner, build, you know, Gawain's, uh, making sure Gawain was a constant presence throughout that sequence and watching him make his decision. You know, all of those things took a lot more work than I was expecting. And the editorial process was one that was far more fraught than I'm used to because I felt so much responsibility to the source material. I wanted to make sure I was doing it as much justice as I possibly could. As a huge fan of Pete's Dragon, uh, yeah. I mean, and everyone on Collider loves Pete's Dragon. Um, we are all so curious about Peter Pan and Wendy and your take on the material. What excited you to make it? And maybe, you know, how is it different than the other Peter Pans that have come before? Personally speaking, it's my favorite thing I've ever made, which I wasn't expecting going into it, but it is, the, it's, I'm, I've never been as in love with a movie as I am with this one. And we're on day, we just finished day 91 of principal of, of shooting. We've got a couple of weeks left to go. And I am, I just love this movie. And it's the most personal thing I've ever made. It's the most, it, I don't know. I just love everything about it, but it is ironically the most adult movie I've ever made. And I went into it thinking that, you know, my way in was my, my, my entryway into this movie was that I've, got a classic case of Peter Pan syndrome. I don't want to grow up. Who does? Uh, and I thought that was what was going to appeal about, to me about it. But in making it, in writing it, and then now directing it and, and seeing it come to life, I've realized that this is a movie about me letting go of that. And I don't know whether that's good or bad. I don't, I haven't processed yet, but it's the first movie I've made from an adult perspective, if that makes any sense. And so it's very true to both you know, the original book and to the elements of the Disney movie that we can <laughs> adapt. You know, obviously there's a lot of things about the animated film that you're just gonna let, leave to leave to the darker side of history, but it's, it's we're not reinventing the tale, but I hope that we are illuminating it and making it a movie of great import. It'll be, you know, it'll be an entire generation's first Peter Pan movie. And that's something I don't take lightly. And I want this to be a, a movie that is, is important to the the children who see that you know Peter Pan's an evergreen property. It's something that will be remade and retold ad infinitum for the rest of time. This version of it will be you know it's my version of it. It's the version that for the next you know ten years will probably be the one that kids watch for the first time until it gets remade again. And I want uh, I, I I want to make a movie that will matter to. The, the, the kids will look back on fondly and, and think that they, they got something from it, that they learned something from it, that it mattered to them. And I hope that adults will feel the same way because me as, as someone who is just now finally feeling comfortable with calling myself an adult, I think there's a lot of valuable material that we've, we've pulled from the source, from the text. And I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm really, I've said it already, but I'm just in love with this movie and I really am excited to, to, to show it to people. I could ask you a million other things, uh, but I know you probably have more interviews. Um, I'm just going to say, seriously, congrats on Green Thank Knight. You. And um, obviously anything we can do on Collider to help you, please let me know. Oh, absolutely. I, I love it. Always love chatting with you, Steve. And uh, I know we always like end up with a fist bump, which uh, we're not in person. So I'm just going to punch, punch <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs>